Good morning, First Baptist Church. I am Keeper Tyler, and I have the absolute privilege to bring you the Sunday School lesson for today. And so uh, we are going to be in Unit 21, Session 4, in your Gospel Project Spring Edition. It kind of looks like this, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, so yeah, Unit 21, Session 4, it's your last session, so hopefully we can hand out those summer sessions maybe later today, on, today at church in our parking lot service. Um, if that means nothing to you, and you don't have a book maybe, or maybe this is your first time joining us, don't worry at all. That's just a tool that we use to, to get another advantage point to what God's Word says and also um, a conversation started with questions and whatnot that we can, we can discuss with our families. Um, and so if, uh, if you guys got your Bibles open or, or turn your Bibles open to John chapter 4, and we're going to be talking about something that's so applicable to our life, something that I like talking about. I like giving application that we can, we can take and, and we can use right away. Um, water is something that, uh, that is applicable to our life. We, we know that if we don't have water, what will happen? We can all answer that. It's gonna, we're going to die, right? Water sustains us. And so Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, and he says, you know, you can keep on drawing this water, but ultimately you're going to have to keep on coming back. And coming back, you're going to thirst again over and over and over again. And, uh, and he says, I can, I can give you something that, that if, you drink, if you drink this living water right, that I'm going to give you, you'll never thirst again. And what, essentially what Jesus is saying is this world has a lot to offer. We can chase after, uh, and it's going to be different in everybody's life. We can chase after a career, a relationship, um, uh, applaud it. Right? We, can, we, can, we can chase after everything. But, and, and they may bring a little bit of satisfaction. They may bring a momentary satisfaction. But... The, they'll ultimately lead to emptiness because, because that's not going to sustain us and that's not going to um, give us that ultimate satisfaction that, that we're all longing for. And so um, Jesus is saying, I can, I can give you something that, that you'll never thirst again, right? And so um, what that living water is, is, it's the Holy Spirit. And we're going to dive in and talk about that in just a little bit uh, here. And so don't worry about if that, if that confuses you at all. Uh, I want to talk about something a little bit different, and, and we'll go this route for just a second, and we'll come right back. I want to talk about sin being not only an issue for everybody, but being the issue. Um, because we're all ultimately separated from God because, because of sin, and God requires perfection. God, God absolutely requires perfection. So Jesus came, that, that uh, Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So what that tells me is that, that absolutely nothing I can do, nothing that I can chase on my own will lead me to God, right? I need to trust in that salvation that, that only God can offer, that salvation that, that Christ did. He came and conquered death, right? Death, where is your sting? And um, Jesus came to reconcile God's people to himself. And, uh, and so that only happens through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we're going we're gonna to dive into this a little bit today. And uh, hopefully we can, we can answer some questions that maybe um, that you've had for a little while and maybe we can reignite something that, that's going on in God's word that, that we can say, man, I can take this and I can run with this. Because um, just like I was talking about how the world has so much to offer that we can, we can chase after and, and it's ultimately going to lead to, to failure, right? Um, we we want to put our hope that's in something that's not going to fail us. And so what that means is that uh, we've all got this... Uh, We've all got this God-shaped hole, as my friend Brian Hankey would, would talk about. We've all got this God-shaped hole in our heart, right? And we can fill that with other things, but it's just gonna, we're just going to need to fill it with something more and something more and something more. It's not going to lead us to satisfaction. But what Jesus is saying, fill that, fill that void with, with what I have to offer, and, and you're going to be satisfied in me, right? Life may, when you, um, when you give your life to Christ, it's not going to be like, oh man, the next morning you're, you're not going to say, man, life is... is is there's no problems. I don't have any trials anymore. I don't have any temptations anymore. Um, and that's not, your, your, your problems are still gonna be there, trust me. But guess what? You're putting your hope in something that's so much bigger than your problems. And, and you're finding satisfaction in, in Christ rather than trying to, to run dry, trying, satis trying to find satisfaction in, in things this world would have to offer, right? And so um, I am the youth leader at First Baptist Church. And the, this is, I think this is like my life verse. And the kids, I think, get really sick of hearing it. Um, it's John 10, 10. It says, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus speaking here, he says, I, I came that you might have life and might have it abundantly, right? So Jesus is offering that abundant life to us. 
And so when I, when I think about this and, and, and coming back to in a, uh, an applicable way, when I think about this in my own life, uh, when I'm chasing after things that, that don't necessarily glorify God in my life or when, when sin comes up in my life and I'm just like, man, I'm just not living up to, to um, I'm not living for, for God like I, like, I, like I need to be. And so when I think about this in my own life, um, maybe temptation, we'll, we'll use that as an example. When I'm thinking about temptation, I'm thinking, man, um, I know that God's word says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? So if, if the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, that, that ultimately that temptation wants to kill, steal, and destroy for me, right? And it, and it wants to kill me. And so, so that's something I can, I, I can find promise in God's word that, that man, so I, I need to turn away from that, do a 180 repent and say, God, you came that, that you might have life and might have it abundantly. And so I can find, I can find hope in, in the midst of temptation because of that, because Jesus came to give us something that, that we can no longer thirst for, from, right? We, he'll, it'll give us and it'll be truly, um, we'll find true satisfaction in Christ. Let's talk about the Lord of the Rings for just a second. Uh, we all know the creature or the character named as Gollum, right? He was formerly a hobbit creature named Smeagol, but he had this, an obsession for this ring and ultimately he had a, an obsession for the power of the ring. He murdered his friends, his family, um, his family shunned him and ultimately exiled him because of what he was doing with the power of this ring, making him indivis- in, invisible. And, uh, and so he, we, we can see that Gollum had a hunger and thirst for this, this ring. And ultimately that led him to, to lose everything. And so um, that brings us to our next question. And, and after this question, we're going to take a second and pause for, for families to, to talk about it. So um, right in your guide, it says, what are some results you have witnessed from people fixated on their desires and addictions? Hopefully you guys had some great discussions with that question. I just want to read the question one more time and we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, what are some results you have witnessed from people fixating uh, their own desires and addictions? And I want to take this one step further, and hopefully you guys did as well. Um, let's examine our own hearts, right? What, what, are some, uh, what are some results that we have witnessed in ourselves when we fixate our desires and addictions on something other than, uh, other than God that, that, that gives us a true satisfaction? What about when we chase something momentarily, right? Something that, that may only bring satisfaction for a minute and ultimately lead to emptiness, um, what, what is, uh, what is it that we're trying to get across here? And the question ultimately is what will satisfy? I think about this in my life with, uh, with working. Um, I, am I, am I living for eternity or am I, am I living just for today? And what I mean by that is, is this life will, will come and go. Um, every time a loved one dies or a friend of mine, uh, passes away, um, I, I stop and think, Man, life is so fragile. So, am I living just for today, or am I and that will be gone in a mist, right? Um, or am I living for eternity, something that will actually satisfy, right? Am I putting my hope in something that 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 I absolutely absolutely can have full confidence in, or am I putting my hope in something that that ultimately will fail me after some time, right? And so that's that's really the question that's coming up here. Am I am I chasing things that that will ultimately leave me? to um, a path down destruction or because that, that our our um our cravings and our desires may not be as crazy as golems here golems here however you pronounce his name um our, our cravings may not be as as crazy as that right we may not murder our friend and, and go down this path of destruction for this power and and this uh and this chase for 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 this ring right but it might be as simple as uh maybe a uh, bring it down to a children's age here, chasing after that extra cookie or that longer time at recess, or or bringing it up. Um, are we chasing after relationships or, or positions at work? Which which all all those things aren't bad things, but let's look at perspective here. Are are we chasing solely after those things, or are we trying to glorify God while we do those things? Right? And we say, God, I give you this, and and like while I'm chasing this higher position at, at work, God, I ultimately want to I want to serve you. And I want to glorify you with my life. Are, are we doing that? Or are we saying, God, I want to be in control. You have no um, reason to, to even talk to me about my life because it's my life, right? And I can do what I want with my life. So I'm going to take control of this, God, because I need this other position. And I don't think that, that that's the plan you have for me, God. And, and that's probably not right. So no. Or are we saying, God, I, I, I'd love a higher position and, and, and 
and, and let's pray about those conversations, right, we can have with, with our bosses, but also say, God, I want to glorify you with, with my life because ultimately I know that you came that I might have life and might have it abundantly. So I can chase after things, but they're, they're ultimately going to lead to dissatisfaction, but I can chase after you, God, and, and, and glorify you with my life, right? Because ultimately that's going to lead to down the road of satisfaction, right? Because in John 10, 10, it says that you came that I might have life and might have it abundantly. So before we move on to point one, I know we were just talking about uh, about jobs and kind of going on a rabbit trail here, but I don't want to miss this point. Um, when we're when we're chasing those things, um, like like a higher position, like like I was saying, it's not bad. A higher position is is absolutely not bad. But where are our priorities in it? Are 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 we saying God? Are we disregarding God and saying I've got control? I've got this higher position, and I'm and I'm going to go for this. Right? Is this is this my priority? Because if that's the case, that will ultimately fail you. Because guess what? Old age is coming, or or maybe that that you know financial stability for that company is it might not always be there, right? And so, are we chasing just that, or are we or are we saying, God, you've given me this 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 job, and I want to glorify you with my life, and I want to chase you with my life, God. You're my priority. You're my number one, and I know that this job is is a gift from you, right? So let's keep it in perspective. While, while we're chasing, though, because like those things are not bad. I don't want to lose point here. Those things are not bad. But where is your priority? Where's your motivation? Where is your heart at? All right, guys. Now we're going to go on to point one. It should be in your books on page 123. Um, and if you don't have a book, don't worry. We're actually going to be in uh, John 4, 7 through 14. I'm going to read those in just a second here. Point one says, Jesus gives the living water that satisfies completely. And I'm going to read that and we'll dive right in. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. For the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask, ask from me a drink, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given, given you the living water. The woman said to her, him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself and did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I love this because Jesus wastes no time getting to the heart of the issue with this woman. Obviously, I hope by this point we all realize that Jesus really isn't talking about tangible water that, that we drink on a day-to-day -day basis, right? That, that we can draw from the well. He's using that as an example. And the, the example he's using is that everybody has a sin problem. Like I said, sin isn't just one issue, right? It's the issue. And so I want to, I want to, um, I want to read something out of Ephesians real quick. You guys can turn to it if you want. Maybe pause the video while you're turning to it, but um, it's going to be Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now in the work, the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived, the passions of our flesh, uh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So Jesus knows the heart of this woman's issue. The heart of, that, the heart of everybody's issue is sin. We are separated from God. We are, we are filthy without the blood of Christ because we, I don't have to say this to you guys because we all know our own lives, right? We know how sinful we are. But guess what? When the blood that Jesus offers we can stand blameless in front, of, in front of God and say, man, I am not uh, who I once was. I'm not anymore because of the work that Christ does. It's, it's nothing what I've done. Uh, I've just accepted that free gift that, that God offers. Right? I can stand blameless and say, God, uh, here's my life. And, and, and this, is, this is who I was. And, and I'm, I'm dropping it because all that, all that chasing and, and, and brokenness, right? I'm, I'm going to lay this over to you because that leads to nothing. But I want to I want to put my hope in that living water, something that that I can put my hope in, something that leads to ultimate satisfaction. So ultimately, all of us are longing and, and searching for something that will satisfy us. And I know that that's got to be true in each of us because it's it's true in me and it's true of 
everybody that I, that I run into, right? And Jesus says, he, he's coming, it's not just a surface issue. Jesus says that uh, this, is, this is a bigger issue. This is a sin issue, right? And so we're chasing things that, that ultimately don't satisfy. And so Jesus says, he, he says, I offer, I'm offering something that, that's the living water that, that you won't ever thirst again because you're putting your hope in something that, that does not fail, right? And so it's all about the work that, that Christ has done and, and putting our faith in what Christ has done. So this next question, um, it, it, it talks about, we're going we're gonna to pause so your families can talk about it, but it says, what are some ways we are tempted to fill the longing in our hearts with things other than God? So for, for instance, some, some might be pornography or some might be working long hours or some might be um, prideful things, right? You, you name it. It might be different for each of us. So I'll, I'll ask the question one more time and then we'll, we'll brief for a moment. So what are some ways that we are tempted to fill the longing in our hearts with things other than God? A lot of things that we chase in life aren't bad things, like we've been talking about. But where is your heart behind the matter and where is your motivation behind the matter? Why are you chasing those things, right? Is it Are you chasing those things to drown something out? And this may look different to each and every one of us. But are you chasing those things to drown something out and not dealing with maybe another issue? Um, or are you are you chasing those things because you, you just don't know what to chase, right? Maybe, maybe you're feeling lost. And so... Um, I want to give you guys a verse today. Um, Philippians 4.11 says, Not that I am seeking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And so um, being content is huge because that will allow us to say, Man, I'm content. I, I have what I, Christ has done what I need. I have, I have put my faith in Christ. And because none of, these, none of these examples are bad, we'll read them one more time. Uh, relationships, riches and possessions, a spouse of a children, or spouse or children, work and accolades, a social cause, hobbies, uh, service to a church or ministry, and others uh, apart from a focus of God. So um, those aren't bad in and of themselves, but are we, are we content in Christ, right? Are we searching those things to replace what Christ has done in our life, to, to give us that, that satisfaction that we're longing for? Because that's, that's ultimately the question that we're asking today is what will satisfy? And, and hopefully we're going to resound on the, on the fact that, that Christ, we can, we, can, we can rest in the promises that, that he has done and the work that he has done. Because ultimately other things won't satisfy. So if you guys will turn with me right, real quick to John 7 verses 37 through 39. I want to show you guys where Jesus is talking about the living water being the Holy Spirit. Um, and so that, that'll that hopefully um, drop some loose ends with that. It says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of the heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet, or for as yet, the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so, basically, what that means is, it doesn't mean that the Spirit was not active, right? And the Spirit wasn't there. It just means that it wasn't in its full and powerful sense. Okay. So, if you guys are still following along in your book here in point one, we've got one um, empty blanks to fill out here, and I want to. Uh, it's actually three blanks. So, I just want to read that real quick so we can get through that. Uh, sin is an infinite offense against an infinite God. Thankfully, God loves his enemies and has sent Christ to be the reconciler between us and God. Through Christ's death, God provides the means whereby that broken relationship is restored and renewed. So your blanks are enemies, death, and restored. All right, so if you turn your book to page 124, uh, we're we're going to look at point number two. It says, Jesus is the prophet who enables true worship. And when I think of true worship... Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is authenticity. And uh, we've been talking with the youth group through the, the book of Luke. We're in the chapter 8 right now. And we've been talking, and the main theme through Luke that we've been seeing is that it's always a heart issue, and then Jesus wants authentic worshipers. He doesn't want somebody that just, that just oh yeah, I'm just going to say and do the right thing. No, Jesus wants us to follow us with follow him with his with our whole life. And so what that means is he wants authenticity. He wants 
us to follow him with everything that we have. And so um, that is hard to do sometimes, but that's, that's the theme that we've been seeing through Luke is uh, it's always a hard issue and he wants authentic worship. So um, we're, that means that we're not going to get into heaven based on our grandma's faith just because my grandma was a good person or just because I'm a pretty good person. That doesn't qualify me to get into heaven. The only thing that qualifies me to get into heaven is what Jesus did on the cross. And so let's uh, let's dive in here. Uh, we're in verses, still in John 4, verses 19 through 24. So the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that, that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will worship will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is for the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when the, t when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Have you ever had any expectation for something that you thought might happen this way or that should happen this way? And God was like, no, I think my plans are, are to happen like this. <laughs> I know for me that's happened way more times than I'd like to admit. Uh, the, the Jews and the Samaritans, the Samaritans in this situation, they were expecting a prophet like Moses, right, to come and answer their questions. But Jesus shows up on the scene and absolutely he is the prophet, right? This didn't happen the way they thought it was going to happen. Jesus came and says, I am the one, who, I have all authority, right? I, I have come, I, I'm, I'm bringing living water, right? You you thirst after what I'm bringing and, you, and you'll find your satisfaction and your joy in me, right? So um, I think as Christians, we can do that. We can, we can be looking for something else and miss what God is doing. I think we all would agree that we can't worship what we don't know. And so this God that we choose to worship, he has, he has chosen to reveal himself through his, through his son, right? He, is, he has chosen to reveal his name and his character through mostly through um, through Christ and through his scriptures and because Jesus is the word made flesh. And so um, Jesus came with all authority and that, that's, that's the coolest part. I, wanna, I don't want to sugarcoat this at all and I want to read exactly what this book has to say because I really like how it says and I don't want to paraphrase it. It says, when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus Christ, he or she is then capable of seeing the kingdom of God and knowing God in truth. So, um, so there's, there's three elements there. There's the Holy Spirit, there's Jesus Christ, and then knowing God and who he is. I just want to read that one more time so we don't miss it. It says, when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus Christ, he or she is then capable of seeing the kingdom of God and knowing the truth about God. So coming back to the fact that we cannot worship what we don't know. So being filled with the Holy Spirit, this living water, allows us to, to worship what we know because God's going to reveal himself and, and his character and his nature, right, to us. And so our next question before we, before we pause and, and have a question or have time with our family to discuss is, what does Jesus in the flesh reveal to you about the God we worship? So one more time, it says, what does Jesus in the flesh reveal to you about the God we worship? And, and we'll just add, what does it reveal to you about authentic worship? So let's reveal that question one more time. It says, what does Jesus in the flesh reveal to you about the God we worship? And I think it reveals a couple things among a lot of things. Uh, it reveals that, that God wants to be involved with his creation. Uh, he hates sin because the, the whole reason God came was to abolish sin, to bridge that gap because we are separated from God. So God made a way possible. So that right there shall, tells me that God has compassion on us and God loves us. He hates sin and he made a way for us. And without, what it also um, reveals to me with authentic worship is the fact that God is ultimately in control. He came and he said who he was and, and he is who he says he was because he conquered death. He, he died on the cross and after three days he rose. I mean, what more can, can you explain to somebody that that Jesus is who he says he is because he came and didn't contradict himself here, didn't contradict himself here. And after death, he did not contradict himself. He rose and, and he says, his death, where is your sting, right? He's conquered over death and we live in that victory as well. We can argue all day long on what worship should look like. 
uh, whether church should start at 9 or church should start at 10, or we should sing new songs or hymns, or if the color of the carpet is wrong, or if we need to be in pews, or if we need to be in chairs, or if Pastor John needs to wear a red tie, right? We can argue about that all day long. But really, at the end of the day, is that really what matters when it comes to worship? Not at all. And I think you guys already knew that question. It was kind of, it's kind of weird anyways. Um, but I really like what the book points out and highlights here. It says that uh, worship cannot be only in spirit, nor can it only be in truth. So they've got to work simultaneously. And I really like how it says, um, it says that worship should be a spirit-empowered proclamation of God's truth. So we need to worship in spirit and truth. And it's a spirit-empowered proclamation of God's truth. And so um, it brings us into our next question, and we're going to kind of highlight it a little bit here, because I don't want to get caught up here, especially me just talking at you. There's no back and forth conversation like I miss and questions and, and me bouncing ideas off you. So I don't want to get into what worship should look like right now, but I do want to talk about this next question, give you a second to answer it, and then we'll jump right into it. It says, uh, what will it look like to worship God in spirit and truth? So we talked about worshiping God with a spirit-empowered proclamation of God's truth. Now we're asking, what is that going to look like? So coming back to our original question here, it says, what will it look like to worship God in spirit and truth? And that may not look different from what you're doing right now. Um, I just want to kind of read a couple examples and give, give some highlights to it. So um, worship in the spirit primarily... Uh, or worship in the Spirit is primarily a heart issue, right? Remember when I said that everything is a heart issue? Where's your heart in the situation? Uh, it is, it's worshiping in the Spirit is a heart issue as well. Uh, it's, it's about the messages we sing, the prayers we pray, and the, the messages being preached. Do they all line up and correspond with God's Word and God's truth? If not, then, then something's off because everything that we, should, that we do should line up with what God's Word says. And it shouldn't, co or could, shouldn't contradict with what God's Word says. And I like what this says here. It says that, uh, that worship shouldn't... Yeah, it may line up with our preferences and opinions, but our preference and opinions in that matter should line up with what God's Word says. But um, worship, it shouldn't, it shouldn't just be our preferences and opinions and our soapboxes, right? Because um, a lot of times our heart leads us astray. We need, we need to measure our heart up with what God's word has and, and does, it, does it contradict with what God's truth says about this situation? Um, and so I really like what this says. It says, worship in spirit and truth will likely lead to conviction, confession, and repentance. Worship can place anywhere or can take place anywhere as we honor God in faith and obey his commands. So what I get out of that is worship isn't just a, a thing we do on Sunday morning with other Christians to, to have fellowship and, and sharpen each other and to uh, get energized for the week. That, that's all fine and dandy, but what I get out of this is that worship should be a lifestyle. That that worship should be a matter of the heart. Okay, on page 125 of your book with point number three, we are talking about Jesus is the Messiah who brings salvation for all. Uh, we're still in John verses 25 to 26, 28 through 29, and 39. So I want to read those real quick, just so you can follow along. 29 or 25 through 26, 28 through 29, and verse 39. It says, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So the woman left the water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who has told me everything I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Many Samaritans from a town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. Look with me in verse 28. It says, So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And then skip down to verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all I ever did. This lady was convicted. She is putting her faith in Christ. She says up in verse uh, 25 here, it says, I know the Messiah is coming. So she already knew that the Messiah was coming. And Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. He's laying down authority. He's saying, I am who I say I am. And this living water isn't just a, a myth or a, a story that I'm saying. This is true. You can put your faith in me. You can find your joy in me. And you can find ultimate satisfaction from me because 
He's using the analogy of the water. You're going to keep coming back, thirsting for more, thirsting for more, thirsting for more. But what I give you is living water. It's going to well up in you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about relationship with, with, with God. Because ultimately, before this, we're, we're all separated from God without that relationship, without that, the, the work that Christ did, without that relationship. Obviously, we're separated from God. God requires perfection, and Christ made a way possible. So, um... This makes me think about a song because of this conversation this lady has. And I think it's kind of a little bit cliche, the song that I'm thinking of. But uh, I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to say it because it, it really drives home the point of proclaiming the gospel and pro proclaiming your testimony, what, what God's doing in your life, what Christ has done in your life. And um, a couple lines of it says, I can talk about the weather and I can talk about nothing all day. So we can all do that. We can talk about the weather and talk about nothing all day. Because when we have nothing to talk about, that's usually what we talk about, right? Oh, the weather's all been awesome. Or this week's going to be great. Yeah, I can talk about that and I can talk about nothing all day. But I want to talk about what matters and what lasts forever. And uh, and so I, I guess that's a challenge for me to you to um, to to really examine. Am I just am I just talking about nothing all day, or am I am I really am I talking about what matters and what am I am I talking about what lasts forever, right? Go, go there forth and make disciples of all nations. Am I, am I doing that? When, when, I, when God's changed my life and what Christ has done or the work God has done in my life, am I really proclaiming that or am I talking about nothing all day? And let's just come down to our next question here. It says, what do we need to be aware of as we proclaim to the world the identity of Christ as the Messiah? So I'll read it one more time. What do we need to be aware of as we proclaim to the world the identity of Jesus the Messiah? And I'll give a couple minutes for that. So let's look at this next question. It says, what do we need to be aware of as we proclaim to the world the identity of Jesus the Messiah? So what do we need to be aware of? What are some situations we might need to be aware of as we proclaim the world and tell Jesus or tell people who Jesus is? And so a couple of different situations might be that somebody doesn't understand and they want to know more. So be prepared to answer their question or or don't be afraid to say you know i don't know that answer but let me get back to you i'd be happy to get back with you um there's another another situation where somebody might respond with rejections right they might just reject you altogether reject the message of christ altogether um there might be another instance where somebody re uh, responds with ridicule or violence and there might be another option where somebody responds with an open heart and say i, I need this i'm desperate for this i'm i'm longing for for this, I, I, I need Christ in my life. And so wherever you are in that, in that road or that, in that path, we don't know whether we're planting the seed or watering it or seeing it come to fruition. We, we don't know that. It's, it's not our job as Christians to save. It's God's job to save, right? We, it's not our, our job to save. It's our job to proclaim the gospel. So I like to use the, the semi-analogy. If we have this great truth and to, to us Christians, the, the, the truth that's been revealed to us through the Spirit, it's, it's, it's the best truth that we could ever have and, and ever need, right? It's the salvation message. And so if we have this truth, um, I, I compare it with a semi. If your best friend's standing in the road and you see a semi coming at them and they can't see it, you will do everything you can to yell at them and push them out of the way and try to get them out of death's way. So in the same instance, if this life is, is here today and gone tomorrow, what is stopping us Christians to, to with that urgency saying, you need Christ, and, and it's, it's not coming from a place of saying, look at me, I'm, I'm way better, and I, I have Christ in my life. It's, it's saying, no, I'm broken, and I need Christ, and, and let me tell you about what Christ has done in my life because of this amazing news that I have. It's, it's that urgency. It says, I am broken, and sin is the biggest issue. And, and heart, it's a heart issue. And so I want to tell you about this, Christ, because I love you. And so it's that type of urgency. And the next question here in your book, and we'll, we'll pause right after it, uh, it says, what are some reasons we might hesitate to share the gospel? So as we close today, I hope you guys were encouraged in God's truth with this story with the Samaritan at the well and learning about living the, this living water that only Christ can give, that, uh, that we can find complete joy and complete satisfaction in. And, to, and then this last part where we can proclaim the gospel with absolute boldness because it should be with urgency that we proclaim the gospel because of this 
amazing news that we have in Christ. And so I just want to end with prayer, and I hope you guys have a great morning. We'll see you guys at church. Father, thank you for this group of people. Thank you that uh, we can come together and worship you in, in spirit and truth, and we can be revealed by you your truth and knowledge in your word, and we can be encouraged by that. We can proclaim your word, and we can be satisfied and content with what uh, the gifts that you've given us, and we can be completely satisfied in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.